Uh, three uh, representatives, Iceland in the old 1800s uh, traditional custom uh, of Gar, and then this is Jensen in a, what we in those days would call a modern dress, <coughs> uh, and then the representative from the Faroe Islands. The Faroe Islands is a small group of islands north of Scotland. And they uh, were originally Norwegian, uh, and the Faroe Islands and Iceland were parts of the Norwegian kingdom. But Norway and Denmark were united for 500 years. And when, yeah, when that union stopped, uh, the North Atlantic Islands stayed with Denmark. That's how Greenland, Iceland, and the Faroe Islands became Danish. So anyway, uh, we're getting the the whole idea of the ex exhibition right in one photograph. This is Danish culture in a wider conception. This is people who belong to the same state, who are all citizens, but are very different. They look different. They have a different culture. They will dress differently, but they are certainly respectable citizens all the way, as the king had showed by his offer. And then it so happened that someday I was contacted by a lady in Copenhagen who said uh, she had read about my interest for this story and she said, uh, and I see that you're interested in Mrs. Jensen. She worked for my family. So the National Museum, for the second time, got in contact with that family. And she said, you may want to come and look, because I think there may be some pictures that my mother never showed the National Museum back in the 60s. So I went to visit, and yes, there were more pictures. Here is Mrs. Jensen uh, in her late 60s. And in that photo album, on the same page were photographs from the little white boy in the front page picture. When he grew up, he moved to the western part of the country and he worked at a, uh, as a gardener. Mm -hmm. And this is the place. So he had his old nanny come and visit <laughs> in Jutland. Many years after she had stopped working for that family, he comes to visit. And the story of this picture is that when, after some years, Mr. and Mrs. Jensen divorced, but she stayed in Denmark. She had lost contact with the family she came with. Uh, the lady had passed away, and the child had been placed with an aunt and uncle, so she had never seen the child before, until one day in the street when they meet. Now the girl was a grown-up lady, and Mrs. Jensen was 17 years older. And they get to talk, and when the girl, who's now the lady, hears that Mrs. Jensen has divorced and is willing to, would like to work for somebody, she moves in with that family. <laughs> with that girl that she had worked that has been nursing. And what I think is happening, and why that wonderful picture that's on the front page of the book, the whole setting of that, that's taken right after she moved in to the family, where she lived for the next 15 years. I think that this little girl on the family picture we saw from Christmas, she has no longer her parents, they lost her parents, and she is taking the West Indies back into her home by meeting Mrs. Jensen. And what the, the lady I talked to said, well, my mother and my grandmother, they all talked about Mrs. Jensen. She was a part of the family. So she stayed in Denmark. She died there in 1945, uh, living on a state pension the last few years as any other uh, 
Jamie's citizen. Yeah, a few other examples of these people. Uh, here it's the, the Mein family. It was one of the families that worked for the Hamburg America company. Uh, and the Mrs. Mein was, was uh, Danish, uh, Danish West Indian. She had grown up, grown up in St. Thomas, but was born in Denmark. And some of her sisters and brothers were born in, in St. Thomas. Here she's back. Uh, will and and gave birth to their firstborn uh, and this is the baptism in Denmark and what do we notice that on the right we see the nanny uh, and I looked for that name for so long and finally I discovered in those files are passengers leaving Hamburg some of you have probably used them have you <coughs> nod your head if you know those files? And this is where you can find uh, departures from Hamburg to, to uh, the Americas. Uh, and there I found a Mrs. Mine escorted by Edith Molina. Is Molina a name that rings a bell to you? Is it a St. Thomas name? Well, I can't prove that she's from St. Thomas, but she works for her family. It's a good old Spanish name, yes. But those are not uncommon in this island. Another example, this is the Bauman family. Uh, Mr. Bauman was a, a government official and reached the level of number two uh, right before transfer. Um, he was second to the governor. And uh, he was the one who, after transfer, took care of Danish government bis business. He stayed here. Uh, here, the Bellman's, uh, Mrs. Bellman is a Hassel. So she was uh, St. Thomas family many generations back. Uh, here they are in Denmark to visit family in the western part of the country, and they're in the town of Kjello. Uh And along with them is traveling Johanna Totman. We find her again in the passenger, passenger list. Uh, they went to Copenhagen, London, to St. Thomas uh, on the, the East Asiatic Company ship. Uh, and nowadays, we can find them in answers to come. Uh, when I looked for Bauman, up came the Bauman family, and there was the name of the nanny. Uh, so another person from here, uh, I think many of you know, uh, the Totman name for the for the connection with with the, the British Virgin Islands. Uh, we do recognize the name even here. Um, and the Stevens family. This story, you know, they come to me in a different ways. This is a member of the Danish West Indian Society. Uh, Jana, Jana kept coming up to me, this lady, Jana Skowolf, who has been here several times for the, for the society. Jana kept coming up to me and saying, oh, Pierre, can you help me? My grandfather was a Negro, you know, I want to know something about him. I never met him. And, and there I was. Well, I can't find out about everybody's family, but uh, maybe someday, maybe someday something will turn up. And it turned, up, it turned out later that Jana in the family album had some good pictures. This is grandfather and grandmother. Um, they are on the road. They were also road people. Because Stevens, he worked as an African too. <laughs> and uh, this is... John is with mom sitting here uh, as a kid and they traveled with their dad and their mom and what Jana says mom always said that grandpa he had the show and grandma sold the tickets <laughs> and I don't know what you think about it but I have the feeling that grandma could take care of the money <laughs> I think that little man, he, he was probably better for the show, and that 
quite big woman. <laughs> she could take care of those money. So that's uh, another story. Uh, in the files, all these places are places that I have found Stevens. He worked in Sweden, he worked in Norway, and he worked all kinds of different yeah. places in Denmark. This island of Fyre, it's just a tiny little island off the coast of the island of Gola. Uh And you can see, wow. So a West Indian simply went with his show to the smallest island in Denmark for a living and had his wife along. Um, something interesting is that in almost all the files where I find of Arthur Stevens, he is <coughs> registered as being born in St. Thomas. Well, it's one moment, one, one time, uh, one occasion. He actually contacted the government to get confirmed that he was Danish. And they wrote to St. Thomas to have confirmation from the church. And nobody could find him. But there were people in St. Thomas who said that they thought this man was from Tertola. <laughs> which means that he is a British subject. And which means that he is a foreigner when he's in Denmark. And which means that he doesn't have the rights to public help and pensions and all that kind of thing. So if he cannot take care of himself and his wife, they will be expelled to Britain. I'll be put on the boat to England. That's how it worked in those days. And uh, I think that's why he always says he's born in St. Thomas. <laughs> so everybody thinks he's dating. And it worked a long time. But for 10 years, he was looked at for by the Danish police because he had had a child before he met his wife. And the Danish authorities wanted him to pay. So every half year, he should pay his father contribution to that child. That's Danish law from the late 1800s. So think about it before you have a child in Denmark. <laughs> So you can, I can follow him, you know, if from one half year to the next uh, in the protocols in Copenhagen. Uh, the protocols that make sure that all mothers get the money they should get from their father. And the police looks for him and did. They don't find him in those 10 years. Suddenly, the couple arrives back in Copenhagen, buys a little piece of land, Builds a house. I must have been making a pretty good living from that traveling around, or whatever, whatever it is. Uh, and I'm sure that he must have gotten some kind of agreement with the, the authorities of paying back all the money that he had owed <laughs> from 10 years not paying his, his uh, father assistance. Anyway. Uh, John and I have had great fun of this, and uh, we had one problem until the day that the book was published. We never find when and where he died. Because Mrs. Stevens died, and then um, Stevens started traveling again. He remarried, he was only 70, so he <laughs> they moved west. They went west in the western part of Denmark. And I had an, the first indication of where he could have gone. And Jana went off to the western part of the country and investigated everything in the area and found uh, a few informations. But it turned out that this was a long time ago. And we still didn't have his death. And then suddenly one man writes me that he was related to some other line of this family somehow and had found his death in the furthest north of Denmark, this very remote area where he was living with his last wife. 
So he had 60 some years in that one. Yeah, that was the story of Stevens. This young man, is photographed in the city of Aarhus, in Western Denmark, about 1914. Would you like to know what's in the other end of that chain? You have seen it out here. You have seen it out here. Now that's why some men. That's James Thompson from St. Croix, Frederickstead. He came around the age of 17. <coughs> he appears the first time in the Files of Copenhagen. He's registered there. Uh, we have these wonderful files that maybe some of you have looked into if you are looking for people in Denmark. It's easy to use them. It's the Copenhagen City Archives that have all personal registration up to 1923 uh, on the internet. Have you used them, Susan? No. They are uh, useful for those who are trying to find out something about people over there. Uh, and I found this man, I could follow him. I could see, okay, he arrives from, from uh, uh, St. Croix or wherever, and then he stays at an address in Copenhagen. Then he leaves for New York, he comes back. Then he leaves for New York and he comes back. Uh, so apparently he was working on one of the Danish ocean going steamers between Copenhagen and New York. Uh, and then, um, after four or five years, he becomes a waiter. And apparently he's good at that business. Now he found his way of living. Mm -hmm. Within a short time, he's a manager. Moves to a different place, of place becomes the manager. Moves to Aarhus, and right away is the manager and co-owner of a restaurant. And uh, not too long after that, he buys a hotel. But now we're at the age of where you have uh, your language is so difficult. Thompson <laughs> 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 Danish will work it out. The law is about when you're not so, you can't buy alcohol. That is very difficult. You don't know that. It certainly is. <laughs> And I just doesn't want to get it out of my mouth. Uh, but anyway, it um, we didn't have that strict laws in Denmark that the United States had. But still, there were less permits to serve alcohol. And Thompson couldn't get such a permit. He actually uh, claimed the authorities that that was because he was black. I'm not quite sure he's white. It could be, but I'm not quite sure if he's right, because there were very few of these permits at that time. So anyway, he ended up selling that hotel and buying a smaller one. For him. And now he got things going. Because if he couldn't have the permit, he owned a nice <coughs> with a membership. Private nightclub in the basement rooms upstairs, and it worked very well. <laughs> one, of the, one of the leaders of the prohibition movement of that era writes in his memoirs and mentions David Thompson in all. And he says, he must have been some special man, and for sure, brainy and a good businessman. Mm -hmm. He knew something about this and about women. <laughs> now there, I don't think there was any prostitution involved in this. Oh no. Mm -hmm. The women served a different course. They were to come up and sit on the lap of the guys and Maybe tip over the bottle of champagne. 
<laughs> so the guy would have to buy another yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good story, isn't it? You know, yes. Whether it's true or not, but it's a fun story. And, and uh, nevertheless, uh, someday I just happened to meet his grandson. He's a member of the Danish West Indian Society. And James uh, Thompson Jr., you know, as if it was clear to everybody, talked about his grandfather as the man who played a role in the very early Danish movie, 1907. It's called The Lion Hunt. And there are these two Europeans who go to Africa to hunt lions. And they hire an African servant. There are only these three actors in the movie. And since it's so old, it's become quite a thing. You'll, you will often see small uh, cuts from that movie. Uh, and it turned out that the servant is James Thompson. <laughs> Well, that was before he became the hotel owner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, there he is. Uh, young Thompson provided me with some mock photographs. This one of his grandfather. And I wish I could tip the door so you could see the head of his son. Um, put that down. <laughs> Sorry. There it is. Uh, so this is Henry Sorensen. The parents were not met, uh, married, so he has the mother's name. Henry Sorensen with his grandmother Sorensen, with whom he grew up. He grew up with his uh, grandparents. And this is most likely his confirmation photo. It was in those days you saw that here too in the islands that they used the marine uh, shirts for the boys. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I mean, grandma seems to have taken the boy into her family. And uh, so he grew up there and while that took place, his dad was still uh, 200 kilometers south of that place. Uh, running his little hotel <laughs> and now starting to become a very public known personality. Even the newspapers could make cartoons about him. And what is going on here is that now and then the business in that nightclub caused trouble and he was fine. And what it says in this one, well, first of all, we get the price of what it is, the, the liquor costs in this business here. And I tell you, it is very, very expensive. And we see that the money bags are in between the bottles. And what Thompson here says, uh, once again, we can't see. Now, on the other side. Um, James Thompson once again had to pay a fine. And then we quote Thompson here. Here you are, my little policeman. <laughs> well, more where it comes from. <laughs> Meaning, I can pay those fines, don't worry. <laughs> but anyway, the trouble in this whole story is that Thompson got into some bad company. And do you know who the bad company was? The police master. <laughs> the police master was one of the customers and a lot of other high class people in this city. And the day came when the police master was fired. Uh, and that drew Thompson into some trouble. And he lost his business permit for five years. He left the town with his wife and they moved north, and he became a manager of a restaurant and had everything worked okay for those five years. And when the time had run out, he moved to the city of Alborg, where he established a new restaurant, a night wow. restaurant, and it's called Uncle Tom's 
Again, a businessman. A businessman before anything. Yeah. That was the Thompson story. Is the son he took over the business, and as the grandson told me when I asked, so you didn't take over the business? No, I sat on the counter all my childhood. <laughs> I have had it <laughs> with a night dress going. So uh, Thompson is there, and this was how it was in the 1950s at the night dress room. Yeah, I'm now leaving the book and giving you a the taste of a few other people. Uh, now it's not sailors, no house servants. We are moving into people who left the islands for education. Mm -hmm. This is the graduating class at the midwifery school mm -hmm. in Copenhagen. I had the idea that there would be uh, graduates in these uh, classes, and I called up the midwifery school in Copenhagen and asked if they had photographs of the graduating, graduating classes. And the lady said, yes, we have uh, quite a few, and, and, but I don't know who they are. And I said, that's not the problem, because I, can know, I know my people. <laughs> you know what I mean. And, and I, uh, there were the last five years before transfer, and in all of them, there was a more or less African background person, often two. In this case, you will notice uh, a person in the middle, and you will also see how the photographer sets up the whole thing here. Now, very prof professionally, Eric, uh, the way of making your picture, designing your picture, uh, that you have this student turning around, looking down here, has been told to look this way. This person lift up her shoe and look out here. And we have people crossing in the way that they're looking. Everything is it's a, like if it was a, a, a theater. Right? What's going on around this person? Mm -hmm. The line in front of her opens up. Mm -hmm. This is midwife Kaitha Eugenie Turn from St. Thomas. She practiced here for many years. Uh, Miss Benjamin uh, has mentioned in, as an example of one of the midwives here who had the training from Delmar. Uh, are you familiar with the, Ms. Benjamin's uh, a booklet about the, the nursing in, in uh, St. Thomas? Yes. And, and she mentions uh, Turn is one of the, the persons. I don't know how you would say this name. Uh, the O with a slash that makes it in my language Turn, uh, but in here, Ton or something. Yeah. Uh, so this is. Miss uh, Tan, who is in, uh, in the graduating class, uh, but notice how this is made. You can consider whether this maybe would be a, a student from Greenland, but there were also members of the uh, Thailand royal family that came and studied in Copenhagen. And this could also be one of the princesses who was at the school. Uh, she looked to me more uh, like she's from Thailand than Greenland. But anyway, they more or less are up, you know, in this hole. And we've got this very strange <coughs> frame around the West Indian lady. And I don't know if you know the word a mandola. But mandola is an art history. The word for a frame around Christ, mm -hmm. shaped as an almond, uh, and it's a glorification. You can see it as, as a way of, of glorifying somebody. It's usually Christ, but it could be used in other cases. I see this 
and is a way of really putting strong yes. emphasis on this is our West Indian member of the class. We are proud. But there are other sides to going to Denmark. George Alexander was from St. Croix and he came over here. He was a plantation manager. But it so happens that his girlfriend left him and he tried to find her and he brought a knife along and he killed her. So he was trialed for murder and at that time they had stopped sending prisoners to Denmark, which had been quite common back in the 1870s, 1880s, beginning of the 90s, but from there on they had stopped because the, some people said it's double prison to be sent off to such a cold climate, so far from home, etc., etc. Uh, but in this case, I think his mental condition is the reason. The, the police in St. Thomas can simply not take care of him. So they sent him to Denmark for imprisonment and six, years, six weeks later, the state prison at Horsen sends him to a psych, psychiatric, mm -hmm. psychiatric hospital mm -hmm. where he lives the rest of his life. A very sad story. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, uh, as other prisoners, is photographed upon his arrival. Uh, and we have a few cases of it. I'll show you just one more uh, person. Alexander Walton from St. Croix, or actually he is from Barbados, but a uh, worker, a plantation worker in uh, St. Croix, who did not kill anybody, but after several cases of violence, uh, he seemed to have driven the whole island uh, crazy. Uh, and he also is sent off to imprisonment in Denmark. Sad stories. Yeah. Excuse me for interrupting uh, about horses, about horses in Denmark. Uh, back in the 80s and 90s, I was in the military, and, and uh, a lot of military men used to go to horse in Denmark to get married because in Germany, the paperwork was too long. You get married to horses in one day. I've been there three or four times. Okay. All right. You get married in one day. Yeah. Yeah. Like they said, you get married. Because in Germany, you need like months and months of paperwork yes. a year. It costs four or five thousand dollars to get married. Guys, you just take the right, go over there one day on the train, come back here. <laughs> <laughs> so are you saying that marriage is like prison? Some of you people know this man. <laughs> just slightly. Well, here he is, he himself, Dave Hamilton Jackson, uh, who grew up in St. Croix and uh, was a teacher and was fired from his job because he had done some, some uh, had some state uh, statements about the Catholics that the government could not accept. Uh, the school teachers, the schools should be open for everybody. Uh, and he was fired for that reason. But uh, we all know that he turned into forming the union and uh, to travel to Denmark. And I think a lot of us have thought that he went there because of forming the union and because he wanted to prepare for changes uh, through that uh, work. I have, through my research, actually discovered that he is almost invited to Denmark. Uh, the situation is that there was somebody who came before him, but he happened to be living in the United States. So the Danish government wanted a local Danish Christian who could say that he represented a large group in the populace. And then Jackson came. Uh, he did not get very much out of his trip as far as reforms go. 
he got the freedom of press and a few other things, uh, but a lot of the things that were uh, on his agenda uh, was not necessarily turned down, but just never happened because transfer came. Uh, but something happened in Denver. Because even though the government didn't listen much to Jackson, he traveled around the country. And here we see him in the street in Copenhagen, speaking to the masses. It's a workers' meeting where he tells about workers' conditions in St. Croix. Uh, and he traveled most of the country and spoke at public meetings like that. And the newspapers were very excited about it. Uh, and the, it affected the opinion different places in the country. So was he fluent in Danish? No, he spoke in English. He could, he, he could speak Danish, but he preferred, when he was on public, he preferred to speak in English and had a translator, uh, an interpreter. Yeah. Uh, but he was, uh, he knew Danish. As a school teacher at that time, he had to take Danish lessons. Um, and therefore, he, uh, he could probably read Danish and, and uh, express himself to some extent. Oh. Well, I mentioned those two children that were sent to Denmark back in 1905. It's a story, you can talk a lot about that story, uh, the whole thing that you sent off children at the age of four and six is far to believe nowadays. Uh, and nevertheless, they were to be there for two months until the exhibit was through and then returned to the islands. And then somebody interfered with this idea and wanted them to stay. And it seems quite clear that the person involved is somebody at a very high level. Because the la lady who had initiated, initiated mm -hmm. the, the exhibit um, did not want the children to stay. So we cannot take responsibility of this. Uh, the president of the committee said, no way can we take responsibility of harming these children. But then suddenly one day, everything turned around. Most likely, the crown princess, who was protector of the uh, exhibit, had interfered. And this is Queen Louisa. Queen Louisa home in Frederickstadt, and also there used to be here uh, in St. Thomas. Uh, she was very much involved in the child care programs here, uh, and corresponded uh, weekly with the, with the sisters who ran the, the institutions um, and followed up on the work here. And most likely, she is the one who had the children stay in Denmark in the true belief that if they grew up in Denmark, they would be like everybody else and speak Danish and we could send them back to the islands and that would be great because they were West Indian Danes. No idea that African or European background would make a difference. It's actually a quite beautiful thought in that era, uh, but also to some extent naive mm -hmm. to have these children uh, stay there. They made it, uh, but the girl died at the age of 16 from tuberculosis, mm -hmm. uh, which was very common. Uh, she was buried on transfer day, uh, which was very common in Europe at that time. A lot of people died from tuberculosis. Uh, Victor made it, and here we see him uh, in his uniform as a soldier, and he went to teacher's training college, and some of you know the story. He became a school teacher, he became the vice principal at his school, uh, and he was a very outstanding member of the Danish society because he showed himself to the Danish uh, audience as being West Indian after transfer. He would go out and make speeches to school classes, to organizations, etc., to say, 
this is how a black man looks like. I'm the one. I'm from St. Croix, and I grew, I had my first six years in Frederickstead, and then he would take ta tell tales from Frederickstead as he remembered them, etc., etc. But the, the, the whole idea was, this is how somebody who's black looks like. Quite a mission when you are one of very few in a white country. Um, very well liked. My father was a school teacher, and, and you know, to him it was really the big story of the, the black school teacher. Who took care of them when they were children there? They were placed at an orphan school uh, where most of the children were without parents or with parents who could not take care of them. Uh, it was a, it's a very good school. It's, it's a uh, high standing. One of our prime ministers uh, went to that school, and um, it's called the Weissenhof School, which is a German uh, teaching system. Um, they went to that school, and they were living with pride in private homes, which caused them more problems than the school. The school was okay. Uh, but, but the private uh, lady they lived with for some time was, was not at all involved with taking care of these kids. Uh, and they, they were moved to better families. Did they receive the permission from the parents and the child for the children to stay there? Well, the, it's the other way around. The mothers did not want them back because they would prefer to have them grow up in Denmark. Mm -hmm. They were were uh, lonely mothers for the children. So it was apparently a relief. That's how it says in the sources. Mm -hmm. What do I know? Uh, but it's it when you see the number of children that, that are in these families, uh, it, there is a possibility that that's, that's actually the case. But I mean, it's to leave your four-year-old daughter on a boat to send her off to an unknown future. But they thought they were going to see them two months later. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, all the information that comes from the islands is that they fully accept that they stay in Denmark. Another Jensen family, a man who came here as a soldier and stayed as a policeman, married a local woman, and they moved to Denmark. We have them in another photograph here. And now the girl, the, the children are in their West Indian dresses. And it turns out, you know, Jensen is a good name, isn't it? It used to be the most common name back home. So when I found these pictures, I, I uh, took the phone book and called up the Jensen's. And I found them. <laughs> Out of thousands of people, I found them. Uh, and a grandson came and brought. Let's see if I can get a picture here. And brought the baptismal gown. Well, so much for that. Yes, yeah, there's some questions. Yeah. Um, it seems like some places in the states where they have communities of like you know Chinatown or Little Italy or whatever. Yeah. Was there any community or area within Denmark where there were West Indian communities? There were so few uh, people from the West Indies, so that's that's not the case. But I can say there were a few of those former sailors who had settled in Copenhagen who met up. Uh, a, we have an interview with a John James back, uh, done back in the 1970s, where he tells that my father, Alexander James from St. Croix, uh, had some friends, and he mentioned names. One of them is the Stevens that we saw, uh, and there's a August Bastion and a few others, um, came to our home 
and they would usually sit and play cards and have a beer, and my mom would come in and say they should speak Danish so she could understand understand them. Uh, so it was a a room where they, you know, it was sort of a chance for them to exchange information from back home and, and talk about the good old days back home. And they are very few, and they are certainly not the same age. Uh, Alexander James had his close friend, August Bastian, uh, who the son also mentioned several times in this interview. And they are the same age, and they may have been friends from back in, in St. Croix. Um, and they follow each other the rest of their life in Denmark, so, which must have been very important that you have at least one person to share your background with. Um, but no, there, it, it's not like a community or something, or a district of the town where people live. Um, so, yeah. I think if, if we fa come up with a fantasy that transfer have not taken place in the 1920s and 30s, there will probably be, have been a much greater immigration to Denmark. And in, had that been the case, I'm sure that there would have been a whole group. Yeah, I have a question.